Well, good morning, MACPA members. Welcome to this very special event. So um, I'm Jackie Brown, I'm CEO of MACPA. I'm really excited to be here um, with you, with our board, with our staff and close to 500 members today. Um, and looking at the registration list last night, I saw many of our volunteer leaders and past chairs, too many to mention, um, and even the future chair of AICPA, uh, past chair of MACPA, Anoop Mehta is here. So congratulations, Anoop. We're looking forward the next year at this time when we can uh, be celebrating your new role. And also with me in the Zoom room here for the first part, um, the professional issues update part of our town hall is our favorite former CEO uh, and chair of MACPA's legislative executive committee, Tom Hood our Chief Communications Officer, Bill Sheridan, and another familiar face, CPA and Director of Development, Rebecca Brown. So Becca, we're gonna open up some conference as IO slides, right? And we're gonna start by getting everyone involved by asking each of you to sign into our polls at macpa.cnf.io. You can just paste that into your browser or use the QR code there. Um, so you can ask questions during the town hall uh, meeting and also vote later on in the annual meeting. But I think most importantly, um, we want to little know a little bit about you, who's in this big room, um, where you work, and and um, and if you're new, if this is the first time you've been to a town hall or an annual meeting. Uh, but most importantly for me, we want to share some good news. Um, what is going well for you? personally or professionally or both, you can put in multiple things, the more good news, the better. Uh, but take a minute now to just start typing into your browser that macpa.cnf.io and help us get started this morning um, with some positivity so that we can get into that place of possibility. Um, you know, we've We've all been through a lot this year. That's that's uh, that's that's something you hear a lot, but it's all true. But haven't we also learned a lot of things? Haven't we also just accomplished a lot of things, um, celebrated some things? So just share at least one thing that right now that sort of makes you smile when you think about it. Um, we want to inspire each other and maybe with, you know, 500 reasons, 500 people here today, 500 reasons to be glad about something today, right? Um, you've also heard us talk about the science behind this, that it's, it's really proven that if you just take a minute to think about what's really good in your life or in the world, you can shift your mindset and um, you can be more ready to do good things. Um, we've been starting our meetings at MACPA like this for a couple of years. And it really is amazing how it works, especially, especially the last 12 months, which has obviously been really extraordinary for all of us. So yeah, Becca and Bill and Tom, I wanna to take a look at these poll results with you and see what's, what do you see? What's inspiring you as you look at some of these good news results? And if you're having trouble logging on at all um, or figuring out where to go, right below where you're watching this video are the e-materials links. And one of those links should take you right to where we're doing the polling, seeing some great um, personal and professional good news coming yeah. through. Got Cicada married. visit. I don't know if I would say that's good news, <laughs> although I have found them pretty fascinating. They are. They are. Everybody's healthy in a family. First annual meeting. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Somebody became a CPA. Congratulations. Welcome. Um, we are Welcome to the profession. Different flavor this time around, too, with a lot of focus on um, starting to return back to a, a more yeah. normal type of lifestyle, which is... Uh, love that after after you know 15 months or so of waiting for this time to arrive now it's starting to to, to get here and, uh, indeed right. somebody just bought a new house and wow the housing market is like <laughs> congratulations to you it's awesome yeah we're seeing health and uh, a lot of people vaccinated now some uh, some new jobs yeah getting to visit family parents grandkids all those things are Today, I, I walked into a Starbucks the first time I ever had to go in without a mask. It's, it was, uh, I, I almost didn't know what to do. It was a moment, right? It was a moment. It was a good <laughs> moment. Yeah. yeah. My wife said the same thing. She went shopping, grocery shopping the other day for the first time without a mask. And she was like, 
breezing through the store, drinking her coffee while she was, and she, she said, it just felt like, she, how'd she say it? It felt like before times is how she said it. So. Before times. <laughs> I love it. Somebody said Juneteenth. We're going to talk about that actually in a little bit too. So indeed, lost a ton of weight. Okay. <laughs> I need to talk to you about that. That is not the situation here with me, but uh, definitely more family time for me. And and um, see how that is. See, doesn't that just. Um... Some good news coming in. It's great to feel that from all of you it out there. Is. It's, uh, it's been a rough year for sure. And uh, getting some um, positive vibes in is way to start. Yeah. Somebody Especially said, thank God, flight. thank God for this beautiful weather. And I can't, yeah, the last couple of days, especially now, if you don't know it, uh, Bill Sheridan actually works out of St. Louis, our, our office in St. Louis, Missouri. He's been telecommuting. He was our first one. How many years, Bill? Uh, going on 16 now, 2005. Years. So we proved it worked early. But anyway, he was telling me this morning, it's going to be 105 in St. Louis. Not so mm -hmm. much for us today. We have had beautiful weather uh, and the blessing of good health too. So using technology to its fullest. We got to turn this into something fun. These are amazing. Thank you. Thank you all for that. So DGIF for sure. Yes. <laughs> And Becca, let's leave that one open in case um, in case somebody thinks of something else uh, that they want to share in that poll. Because the the more good news um, we have, obviously, the better. And we both opened up a couple of other questions too, having to do with um, when will we see you again at an MACPA event. So we're trying to figure out that whole uh, blended learning live hybrid thing too. So we're asking this question at all our events. When are we gonna, when do you think you'll be coming back live to an MACPA event? And then when do you think you'll be spending at least 50% of your time working in the office? We've all been working, right? Nobody, it's not back to work, it's back to the office. We're collecting all of this um, just to help us get an insight into when things will be back to that different normal or or post covid or or what what did allison call it bill the before times before times <laughs> <you know. laughs> but uh next slide i'm, I'm actually going to move to some more good news that happened 156 years ago um some of our member firms and organizations are remembering today and somebody mentioned it in the good news too and and we want to recognize it you've seen it referenced as Juneteenth, but it was June 19th, 1865. And that's the day um, we can all celebrate the freedom, the emancipation um, of those who were enslaved in our country. Uh, so many companies are closed or closing early in observance. Um, it just became a federal holiday, or I think it will become a federal holiday, but it certainly was a significant turning point in our history. Um, it signaled the beginning of a journey. I would say that we all will continue till one day in every sense, in uh, race, gender, age, nationality, orientation, disability, like inclusivity, which is one of our core values. Inclusivity, it isn't just a trendy word, but it's a reality in our workplace and our lives. And so we're gonna talk later about the crisis for talent in this profession and the work of MACPA's foundation and that sort of critical pipeline development, but it starts with um, every person who aspires to be a part of this profession, having the opportunity to be included in this profession um, and to be successful. So next slide, here's something else you've seen before, either on our website or in our town halls, uh, really at all MACPA events. These are the partners that want this profession to be successful too. We consider this our ecosystem of preferred providers, but they're, they're really strategic relationships um, that make this profession, your organization, your own careers uh, future ready. So the slide may be familiar, but it's also constantly changing as we add new preferred providers to this list and by the categories created here um, really to help you find what you may need now or later, but hopefully you can find some time to explore soon. Um, Next slide, these strategic relationships and thought leaders are going to be featured at our virtual beach retreat. And I mentioned we're kicking that off today, but it is not too late to register for any of these sessions um, that start next week. 
So, and this year, Cordia Partners is actually sponsoring a virtual lunch for attendees who come on either Wednesday or Thursday. So we need to get your registration today for any of those sessions so that we can get your Uber Eats certificate to you. So that's just crazy to me, Uber Eats. Somebody took a look at a hard trend and said, okay, people don't have time to cook. That's not necessarily new. They don't wanna to go to a restaurant that's kind of new and, and, they, and they too busy to get carry out. So what if we could deliver it to them? What they wanted, when they wanted it, without leaving the house. So that's Uber Eats and somebody, somebody was very creative. And then one of our partners said, hey, let's, let's send some Uber Eats certificates to MACPA members who come on Wednesday or Thursday. So we need to get the registration for that today. Um, anyway, that's this year's beach retreat, but next year, we really, really, really wanna be with you in Ocean City, City eating together. Um, and we hope you'll be ready and, and hope, um, Hope to see you there. So, so just a reminder of what we do and why we're here to connect, protect, and help each of you achieve great things in your career, in your organization, in this profession. Uh, we want to make that positive impact with you and for you. So next slide, here's, um, here's part of our staff team that I'm privileged to work with to make that happen. We've got uh, 10 other team members. Um, and that's actually down by nine from last year. Uh, I would say we've always been a scrappy bunch, but uh, now even more lean and mean and ready to continue to sort of take on the new year together. So Skip Falatko is a CPA and he's our CFO. Laura Swan is also a CPA and our controller. Bill Sheridan and Becca, you've already met. Uh, Mary Beth Halper, and many of you know her as our liaison and leader of all things technical, legislative, regulatory, and then Dee Sullivan as our director of learning who's behind the scenes making all the professional development things that happen at MACPA really excellent. So, and Greg Rittler, he's CEO of Blue Ocean Ideas and he provides all our marketing and technology support. So next slide, we couldn't do what we do without each one of you, all 500 and all almost 7,000 CPA members, close to 8,000 with all of our candidates and students and things, but we couldn't do it without each one of you committing to be a member of your professional association. But also included is this uh, growing list of organizations and firms who have decided to support all their professionals being a part of MACPA too. So I know it's really tiny, but if you don't see your na company's name on this list or your firm, we wanna add it. So just reach out to anyone anyone on the MACPA team and, and ask how you can make that happen. So uh, my last slide before turning it over to uh, Tom and Bill and Becca is a big thank you to the firms and organizations who have designated a champion to be a liaison to their teams to make sure each professional in these organizations gets the most benefit from being connected to MACPA. So if, if you want to be a part of this list, I would say reach out to Becca and, uh, and let's make that happen too. So, so now we're ready to take a look at the hard trends. You know, those future facts that we talk about that will happen or maybe actually are happening right now in the profession. Um, we're going to talk about those and what you need to know and, and maybe more importantly do to leverage them as opportunities um, and certainly not to miss them as disruptors. So the global futurists we've worked with for many years, Dan Burroughs says these fit into three buckets. There's legislative, regulatory, technology, and demographics. So that's how we're going to break down this update. Tom will first talk about the legislative piece from his seat as chair of MACPA's legislative committee and certainly now in, in his view from the AICPA federal trends and, uh, and the bill would pick up on all things technology that he sees from his lookout post role and Becca will wrap up on um, what the demographics of the profession look like. But one more thing I just want you to keep in mind before we give you a view into these trends, these things might look challenging, um, but I want you to know from my perspective. This profession and MACPA has a really rich history of making an impact, of flipping these challenges into opportunities. Um, but I'll also say it takes each one of us. It takes the power of community. And we're going to talk about that later as well. So Tom, 
why don't you kick us off with the first hard trend, the legislative regulatory, and then we'll move through the technology and uh, demographics. Awesome. Well, first of all, it's it's uh, an honor to be back. And uh, as you can see, I'm uh, down in Annapolis in front of the State House. Actually, I'm not really down in Annapolis, <laughs> but the beauty of virtual backgrounds. Uh, I am still in Maryland and, and uh, will stay in Maryland. So uh, that's kind of nice. This, um, we, you know, we, we have uh, continued to look at advocacy in a big way. And I want to give you an update of what this past year has been, and we've actually set some records even through the pandemic. And these are the buckets that we advocate and work on, standards, federal level legislative, state, uh, and the State Board of Accountancy, kind of the four, we call them the underground pipes that we try to maintain from an infrastructure standpoint that supports um, not just our profession, but the capital markets in general. So let's go to the next slide and we'll talk about one of the breaking stories is the merger of uh, SASB and the IIRC. Of course, we love acronyms in this profession and now we've added a few more. That's the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board and the IIRC is the Integra International Integrated Reporting uh, Consortium. Both of those have now merged to create the Value Reporting Foundation. You know, this is the, the merger, if you will, of the ESG movement, environmental and social governance. And you're gonna see this accelerate. This is one of those trends that we're seeing. It, it, it kind of comes on top of you know, climate change as that's been moving uh, more and more faster. The International Integrated Report has been a, a, a thing that's been moving for about the last 10 years and they're accelerating. They're certainly accelerating overseas in the EU, but it's clearly moving in the US as well. And this merger is a big kind of indicator of how that's gonna be progressing. So you wanna keep that on your radar. It's not a immediate piece and advocacy. We won't know until we see this moving. It also follows the kind of restructuring of IFAC, the International Federation of uh, Accountants and how that's gonna be um, overseeing parts of this. So let's go to that next slide. We'll get into legislative. So this past year, you know, the minute the pandemic started, we were actually in Annapolis um, fighting sales tax on services. And I'll never forget that moment. Literally, we had just defeated that bill uh, in the committee and within a couple of days they closed the state house for the first time since the civil war that was the beginning of the pandemic and they literally wouldn't let any legislators or anyone go in there and that certainly changed the dynamic because meeting with legislators became something you couldn't do unless you were doing it on zoom but we have a history of this anticipating trends and then being proactive in legislative advocacy. So for instance, nano learning five years ago, we knew that nano learning was a major piece coming. That's, you know, micro learning, little chunks of learning. And in our work with Dan Burris, he had a program that actually had nano learning built into it. So we went to our state board of public accountancy, uh, asked them to consider a new regulation to allow it. And we were one of the first two states to enact nano learning. Subsequently, us in Ohio went to NASBA and that became a national standard because of what we did. So um, it still isn't everywhere, but it is allowed in Maryland. Obviously the work that we've done to innovate in our association itself, including structure and governance, many of our past chairs, literally this goes back to the year 2000 when we uh, created the young member task force and innovated around that. Um, some of our past leaders like Tammy Bensky and um, Byron Patrick and Kimberly Ellison Taylor were all in that under 35 group that we started. Uh, and then as we started to get more and more um, kind of proactive, we started this lookout post that Bill has really taken forward and this idea of keeping us all future ready by trying to, to anticipate the things we can and be agile to respond to the things that we couldn't see coming. Um, clearly sales tax on professional services has been, we fought it um, and defeated it over many years, 
Last year was probably the biggest battle, or well, two years ago now, uh, was the biggest battle that we saw ever. And you can see that little picture was when we went down and mobilized with the Chamber of Commerce, a whole community of professional associations and businesses to actually um, fight that bill and successfully. Then we go right into that um, pandemic. And you know one of the things we had to do was get us essential worker classification because it, you know, it was like March 20th, um, Governor Hogan issued the state of emergency. And isn't it cool that just this week he announced the removal of that state of emergency. That's what immediately we said, wow, this is gonna stop all of our members from going to work to finish the work, whether you are public accounting doing taxes or you were in the corporate side trying to process payroll and keep your finances moving. So we, we found this um, clause. It turns out we are essential workers under the Department of Homeland Security's um, Cyber Infrastructure Security Agency. So that was, we used that, we reached out to Governor Hogan on a, I'll never forget on a Friday and said, you know, Governor, we're seeing states begin to close. We're anticipating you doing that. Would you consider us essential and get and grant us that? And certainly that Saturday, he said, yep, you got it. And that Monday he closed the state. So uh, that was, a, I, I felt really good that we were able to get that done. Clearly the next big thing was sinking the tax deadlines from the state, the IRS, trying to get the deadlines extended. That was a huge effort that involved Congress. We, we coordinated with the AICPA on that and we had to also work with the comptroller um, from that standpoint. And then we also had to quickly pivot and extend licensing and CPE deadlines as we went through this crazy pandemic. So um, that's what we've done and that's what we'll continue to do. Now this past year, this has been, we were involved in basically every one of those federal relief programs. We were reaching out to the SBA, Treasury, the, the bankers in Maryland to coordinate all of this activity uh, in an unprecedented time with actually $7 trillion went through this system over the past year. And um, all of you, whether you were in public accounting or in management and corporate accounting, nonprofits, you were all essential to helping your businesses navigate this. So I want to thank all of us, all of you, for all your efforts through, I know what had to be probably one of the biggest marathons we've ever had to, to run. And it still isn't over, right? You're still in the midst of all of these um, things that are going on. So in, on top of it, we had to do that through a changeover in the administration, right? We had a new president, the whole executive staff, uh, all those cabinet positions changed over and we were still advocating throughout that piece. So uh, again, thank you for all of you that helped us in that notion. And uh, actually we did uh, some pretty good work through that. Next slide. So when, when I uh, made the choice to uh, move up to the AICPA, one of the things we were saying is how are we gonna maintain all of that uh, amazing legislative stuff? And the good news is, We've always had a, a lot of help from our friends. We, we used to have this more of an informal thing, but we decided, so Mary Beth's been continuing. She's been uh, behind all of this from day one. She's gonna help us coordinate this. I'm gonna be a volunteer chair. I am still a member. I am still a CPA in Maryland. So we said, okay, I'm gonna do that. Barry Melanson agreed to me continuing to play that role here in Maryland. And, uh, and then we reached out to some of our firms who've been active on, uh, managing partner calls, et cetera, including our uh, current chair, Avonette, who came on as one of our members in business and industry. So this is our crew that's helping us now proactively start thinking about what we need to do from a legislative advocacy perspective. So uh, I wanna thank all of them for doing that. All right, so then we had our first meeting of this group a couple of weeks ago. And we gave them the history of our legislative advocacy, what we've been doing, by the way, which goes back to 1900, when we enacted the CPA statute, third state in the new union to do that. Um, this is what they said when we went through that history and how they thought about what we've been doing. So uh, it was good, but you can see what they're saying is we've got to be fiercely proactive because a lot can change quickly. And we're gonna talk about some of those things that in fact are doing that right now. 
Um, the notion of relationships, the grassroots piece, we did lose the digital ad tax bill um, that was overridden despite a governor Hogan veto. And, uh, and that almost, we had to jump quickly on that because that was gonna tax all of our CPE to all of you um, and still has remnants that we're gonna be um, dealing with. But this is what we have to do. We're gonna continue to need all of your help probably more than ever in the next couple of years as we see some of the big changes that we're dealing with. Next slide. And then I have to purse that you guys made my day on this. I kept saying over time with Mary Beth that I wanted to completely swamp Annapolis with CPAs so they know who we are and they know how strong we are. Now, who would think in a pandemic? So we said, if we could get a ton of CPAs virtually and let the legislature know that we're here, what would that be worth? So close to 600 of you jumped on Zoom with us and we had the presiding officers of the legislature, right? Um, President, Senate President Bill Ferguson, Speaker of the House Adrian Jones. We had the Senate Chair of the Budget and Tax Committee, Guy Guzzoni, and um, Brian Feldman, a Vice Chair of Senate Finance. So some of the most powerful legislators in Annapolis saw that we could mobilize 600 CPAs, and it really made a remark. It also turned out Senator Ferguson's dad was an accountant, and we presented our history book to both of those presiding officers who now know a lot about our history in Maryland. But thanks to all of you, you made that huge. Now we're, we're trying to think about what we do going forward. And we might be thinking of an and, we might do a virtual session for those who can't get down there uh, in person. And then some level of key person notion in person down in Annapolis. So um, stay tuned for that. I think right now we have January 20th planned as the date. So um, mark that on your calendar and either virtually or live or both, we're gonna be thinking about that. Okay, next slide. So uh, this is what happened in the 2021 General Assembly. Um, we were worrying about onerous employer COVID regulations. We went and tried to pass a proactive limited liability bill for employers. We saw a horrible regulation in Virginia and there was a proposal pre-session uh, to the House um, Economic Matters Committee and our proactive, even though we didn't pass that limited liability, they didn't pass the flip side of it, which would have been increasing liability for employers. So we, we actually think about that as a win. Um, we were ready for sales tax on services to come back, but it did not. Um, we were worried about data privacy that was brewing and that did not get introduced. I think because of all the COVID uh, distractions from that perspective. Um, there was a technical correction to a prior year bill on the pass-through entity legislation. Many of you were um, on our tax list serves. We're talking about how, how bad that was. Karen Cirillo helped us get that and we did get that passed. Um, we were also worried about anti-licensing legislation. This is a, a trend, a bad trend that's happening all over the, the nation. And um, about 20 states had really bad bills in it and we did not in our, um, in Maryland. Uh, we supported amendments that digital, this is the one that was like in the last minute when Hogan vetoed that bill, they overrode that veto and immediately implemented this tax, which is, which is horrible. Um, no one had time to do anything with it. So we had to quickly mobilize to get that fixed. Um, Senate Bill 787, that digital product tax. Uh, the whistleblower reward program. This one is, um, we we're watching it. We opposed it because we were worried about this idea of false claims. We'll talk about that later when we have time, but that's a very dangerous development that trial lawyers are using to try to rope in CPAs on a um, either disputed or fraudulent tax filing um, relative to a client. And then uh, 495 HB, House Bill 495 was eliminating decoupling from the CARES Act. So the, the back a ways back when they did the uh, major tax legislation, Maryland opted to decouple from federal legislation if it had an impact, I think of over $5 million on Maryland tax revenues. So that meant things like the, the PPP laws, the, the um, forgiveness of the PPP loans, that was gonna have an economic impact on Maryland. 
And we had to decouple so that we were allowed to get that um, provision to flow through to the Maryland taxes that you all file. All right, next slide. I think we want to do a poll, Becca, right? In terms of this was what our legislative executive committee ranked a couple of weeks ago. We want to see what you think about these legislative pieces. And Tom, there is that uh, new one since, the, since we made this poll with our executive committee. So I don't know if you want to talk through that as the results start to come in. Yeah, let me talk about a development that literally just happened. We actually postponed our legislative executive committee meeting because of some developments uh, we were hearing at the AICPA that we're now watching a lot. And um, that is, you know, you might have heard the news that the PCOB was disbanded. Now that that means for the first time we're seeing a very politicization of the PCOB and the SEC. Now this is going to affect any of you that deal with public filing, but as we know from the Sarbanes-Oxley history, that that often cascades down into the private sector. So for instance, we're actually hearing that there's consideration that they might get rid of the private company financial standards part of FASB. Keep in mind, under all the new structures in the last probably five years, the SEC is in charge of funding the FAF, which is in charge of FASB and GASB. So now you've got that in a politically centered area. They've changed the SEC leadership under the new Biden administration. And they've been, we've been told they're going to be much, much, much more enforcement driven. That led the SEC to disband the PCOB. They, they had a three year staggered term for a reason. That was to keep continuity across that standard setter, right? For public company accounting groups. And instead they disbanded all of them and are gonna be reappointing them. So we're gonna see, we think a much more activist PCOB. And uh, obviously the AICPA is already mobilizing from that standpoint. We're already beginning to prepare for a much more active federal advocacy piece. We'll be talking to our legislative executive committee about that. We'll be talking to a lot of you about that because we might have to start meeting down in Washington DC and meeting with our congressional reps. We're gonna ask you later today, if you have any key contacts with our federal legislators or Marylanders. So if you know any um, federal senators or House of Representatives, and then if you know any of our state legislators, we want you to let us know that so we can beef up our key person program um, with your help. So right now it looks like sales tax on professional services continues to be big. Second, the professional occupational licensing threats third digital uh, sales tax implications, fourth looks like uh, data privacy uh, and anti-licensing legislation. So um, I can tell you that the data privacy, the thing that we worry about is oftentimes the way they write that law, it says, for instance, nobody can have any social security number information. So how are you gonna do taxes if they do that? And they've actually done that once that we had to quickly repeal um, so that's the kind of key content. We, we like data privacy. We just don't like it when it has unintended consequences to the ability for CPAs to do the work that we do. Um, you can see we also might see a rise in employment laws in the state level as a result of all the, the um, activist pieces that are going on right now in our uh, society. And by the way, that tax commission down there, the almost three from the bottom, we call that the Feldman Act or the Feldman Commission. We, we've been advocating for a commission in the government, I mean, certainly in the tax system, at the legislature, to be mobilized to look proactively at Maryland's tax laws and not always react. So just like that data privacy thing, right? They just enact it. They don't even look at the implication, especially from the compliance side, and that creates that complexity that we have to deal with. So that's why we're, um, we're, we're going to support Senator Feldman again. And, and we'd love to get that kind of commission. And we also want a CPA to be on that as a permanent member so that we can advise the legislature when they start thinking about um, all these crazy laws that they like to put in. OK, good stuff there. Lots of good feedback. Pretty close to what we had there. So what you can do to help attend CPA Day, January 20th. 
donate to our PAC. We, we, it's the only way we can actually legitimately give money to a legislator and make get their attention to meet with them. We'll actually go with any of you that are key people and give you PAC money to go meet with those legislators with us and our lobbyists. And then you can see the bench there and it looks pretty empty. Um, we've had some amazing members over time that have been huge in their relationships with legislators. Uh, Larry Kamenitz is probably like the grandfather of our legislative advocacy. Dawson Grove, rest in peace, past chair, was an amazing, had major contacts like that notion. Um, we've had many, many more. Al DeLeon took on that and still is active in that notion. But here's the point. We had a super varsity team and they've all retired and we don't really have a JV. So any of you that are willing to say, I'll be a key contact, or I'd like to learn how to do a key contact. And we have to build this bench both at the federal level and at the state level. And, and we actually haven't been as active federally except with this exception of all this PPP stuff in the last year. And that's really where we said, we've got to start building this back up. So we need your help because together, if we can mobilize, they pay attention to grassroots and that's how we've been successful. All right, next slide. There's the pack. You guys could all take that link right now and, and give us you know $10,000 each. That would be awesome. Uh, or even $10. I know CPAs, as I like to say, are rather frugal. Um, and many of you don't like to donate to this, but I will tell you that the trial lawyers, they raise about a half a million dollars a year and they use that to influence legislators to enact crazy laws like the False Claims Act or tort liability and all these other areas that are um, quite frankly hurting our profession or could be very, very dangerous. So hopefully you'll help support us in that notion. Uh, next slide. And I want to close with this because I feel very proud of continuing our legacy here. Um, we do have the best regulatory infrastructure for CPAs and CPA firms in the United States. And, and I'm proud to say that. Um, individual firm license mobility. We were early on in Uniform Accountancy Act. Comprehensive definition of a test. And by the way, there's some proactive clauses in there that like lock in SOC reporting and some other uh, digital parts that we were proactive around the country and enacted in Maryland for your benefit. Top firm liability environment, we've uh, continued to keep contributory negligence. We're one of only five states left. This is where the trial lawyers every year think about trying to take that back. Um, Non-CPA ownership, simple majority, best CPE environment in the, in the nation. CPE is CPE. We don't have all the crazy restrictions or any of that stuff. And we have nano learning. And thank God, we had 100% e-learning before we had to do 100% e-learning. Um, separate State Board of Accountancy Fund. We did get approval for marijuana and cannabis uh, work by CPAs. And second lowest licensing fee in the United States, 28 bucks a year. There will be some increases. The State Board is going to increase it. But I think we'll still stay either um, one of the lowest, if not the lowest. So with that, um, I'm honored to have this group working with me and continuing our efforts in the future. All right. I guess that brings me to the agenda to talk a little bit about technology. Tom, thanks for that um, really comprehensive look at, at, at what's going on uh, on the uh, legislative and regulatory front. And man, it's, there's, it's hard to keep up with all of that um, at times and, and not really at times, all the time. It's hard, <laughs> hard to keep up with everything that's going on and all the stuff that we need to pay attention to. Uh, next slide, which kind of brings me to um, this point, right? I mean, there's just a, I mean, you heard Tom talk, there's a ton of stuff going on. And that was just one of these three uh, hard trends that we're talking about, right? Um, so much stuff to be paying attention to um, on the legislative and, and regulatory front, certainly on the technology front. I mean, we've been banging the technology drum for, for years and that train's not slowing down, it's speeding up. Um, more and more of the stuff is coming at us faster and faster than ever. Um, demographics, you're gonna hear Rebecca talk about. 
all the all the and there's a just a ton of recent research that's just come down the pike recently that that uh, bears uh, paying attention to on the demographic side. So there's just a ton of things to pay attention to, and nobody really has the time or the energy or or the inclination to to you know pay attention to all of it. It's almost impossible, um, right? And then you throw into that mix this notion that that really on top of all that, we're just all busier than we've ever been. Right. We're, we've all got more work to do than ever before. Um, uh, busier than ever before. I, 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 I know a, 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 a researcher who might challenge that and say, really, it, it's not necessarily that we're busier than ever. It's that we're more distracted than ever. Um, uh, thanks to, you know, things like our, our phones and the little notifications pinging us every five minutes. And we feel like our, our attention is being um, uh, stretched pretty thin these days. Um, but yeah, that, that's really our number one issue, right? Is just all of the stuff going on, plus the fact that we're busier than ever before and who has time um, to really make sense of all this stuff. And it's challenging. It's a, it's a really big challenge. And then, um, you know, this happened, right? So, you know, we've been, like I said, we've been talking about these, these changes in technology, these advancing, exponentially advancing technological um, advances for, for years, almost decades now, um, trying to get people to pay attention to things like cloud computing and, and, and artificial intelligence and blockchain and, and all the rest. And, and people get it. I mean, they, they've gotten it for, for years and years and years. But I think the general notion for a long time was, I understand this stuff is important. We've got time to figure it out. Um, it's not top priority. And in the meantime, look at the pile of work that I got to get through, right? So we're, we're going we're gonna to pay attention to this stuff, keep telling us about it, um, and we'll get to it at some point. And um, at some point actually happened to be, I guess, uh, early March of uh, 2020, which is when COVID kind of crashed through our uh, walls and forced our hand on this stuff, right? Suddenly we had to immediately pivot and take advantage of some of these technologies so that we could just get our work done, right? When you're talking about things like setting our teams up to work remotely, right? And how do we keep them healthy and all these other things. This, this notion of digital transformation suddenly wasn't something that we would get to someday. It's something we had to do now, thanks to that pandemic. And uh, um, Jackie mentioned at the top of the, top of the uh, uh, meeting today, uh, Daniel Burris, uh, a futurist that we've been working with for years now, and uh, and he's actually done some research over the past year, a little more than a year, about the impact that uh, the pandemic has had on a lot of these technologies that we've been talking about for years. And uh, uh, over and over again, what he found was that the pandemic has acted as an accelerator of these exponentially changing technologies, right? I mean, we, they were already changing exponentially. And now you throw a pandemic on there and it's accelerated the pace of that change significantly. I mean, you can see some of the numbers, some of his estimates there, the, the notion of e-commerce um, thanks to the pandemic accelerated by almost a decade in, in, in about a year, a little more than a year. AI, machine learning, cognitive uh, machines uh, accelerated by six, six years. Um, and this, is, this was early in the pandemic, right? Um, not even not even today, but early on in the pandemic, remote working, um, perfect example of acceleration due to the pandemic. A, a, another decade down the line, you know, we are where we would have been ten years down the line. We are here today, thanks to the pandemic, and and you see this over and over again. I think there's another list uh, on the next page, right? Um, Again, tele-education and remote instruction. If you've taken any CPE from the MACPA over the past year, you know how quickly um, that trend has accelerated thanks to the pandemic. Blockchain, uh, adaptive and predictive cybersecurity. So over and over again, that's exactly what we're seeing. Is it something that we always had our eye on as a trend that was, um, that was advancing exponentially suddenly advanced, we didn't think it was possible, but it advanced even faster than that over the last year or so, um, thanks to the pandemic. So really crazy stuff, 
And we're seeing this not just in technology, by the way, but in, in uh, gosh, a number of other areas as well. In fact, there's a book that came out, um, I think late last year, early this year. It's called The Future is Faster Than You Think uh, by a couple of uh, New York Times reporters, uh, Peter Diamandis and, and Stephen Kotler. And it's subtitled, How Converging Technologies Are Transforming Business Industries in our lives. And I want to just spend a couple of minutes on this because I think they make a really important point about where we are with technology right now. Okay, we keep talking about exponential change in terms of technology. But what they're finding is that these exponentially advancing technologies are in and of themselves creating other exponential changes in pretty much every corner of our lives, right? Um, you know, Moore's Law, uh, we've been talking about this for years, uh, states uh, in really simple terms that the overall processing power of our computers doubles every year and a half to two years. And that's been true since the mid 1960s. And some folks think that that might be leveling off at some point. It, 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 there's just going to be a natural leveling off of Moore's Law at some point. But then, you know, you talk about the next step in computing, which uh, they call quantum computing which uh, the, the authors of this book say is, is gonna be like Moore's law on steroids, right? So um, these technologies are just going to continue to advance at an exponential pace. And so they're gonna be with us for a foreseeable future. And that, th these authors, they write that every time an exponential technology reaches the end of its usefulness, another one arises in its place. So this is, this is something that we were, we're just gonna to have to live with every day for the rest of our lives. And what we might not realize, they say, is that the impact that that rule, that, Moore, that Moore's law exponential rule has on nearly every other corner of our world. It's not just technology that's increasing exponentially. Um, these authors make the point that they think there are seven forces in the world right now, each of which is a byproduct of converging exponentials, right? Kind of a second order effect uh, in, in technical parlance, it acts as a, an additional innovation accelerant is what they're calling it. So I guess really what it comes down to is this, as technology increases exponentially, it forces other areas of our world to also increase exponentially. So those seven forces, what are they? Think, think about these things for a second and the impact they have on your lives. Force number one, saved time, okay? Here's what they write, innovation demands free time. The more free time that advancing technologies give us, the more we can innovate, right? They, 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 at one point in the book, they write, buying a watch used to require you know, going to the store. Watching a movie meant riding in a car to a theater. Booking a plane ticket once included telephone calls and hold times, and, and sometimes having to talk to an actual human being. God forbid, um, but not anymore. And all this has consequences, right? Saved time isn't just a benefit of technology, it's a driver of innovation. So the faster these technologies advance, the more time they're going to save us. And that's going to allow us to do even more things from an innovative standpoint. Force number two, availability of capital. They say creating new technologies requires money and lots of it. Um, the paradox is that new technologies have given us countless ways to raise money, right? Think about things like crowdfunding and venture capital and initial coin offering. So it's a, it's a technology turbo boost, so to speak, that's turning dollars and cents into ideas and innovation. Uh, the third force that they're talking about is demonetization, okay? And the, the example that they point to is um, sequencing. Um, the human genome, right? Uh, in, 21, or in 2001, rather, we, uh, sequencing the entire human genome took about nine months to complete, cost about $100 million. Today, latest technology today can do it in about an hour and for $100, um, or 6,480 times faster and a million times cheaper, right? So if, as a result, if you're working in genomics, then your governor, uh, government research grants now go a whole lot further than they did before. And that's happening across industries, right? Um, we're getting way more bang for our buck now, uh, which is going to allow us to do more innovative things. And th again, this is all due to advances in technology. 
I love this one, force number four, the fact that there's more genius available in the world today, right? In decades and centuries past, uh, discovering a true genius in the world was like finding a, a needle in the haystack. But with today's kind of interconnectivity and the exponential explosion of networks, you know, we're all connected pretty much. And the fact that all these people can work together these authors argue that all of these barriers to discovering genius are now starting to fall. And the result is that we're gonna see more breakthrough ideas, faster innovation, greater acceleration. I mean, really incredible stuff. Uh, uh, fifth uh, force that they talk about is the abundance of communications. The more networks we have and the more people who are connected, the more innovation that takes place. Uh, I love the stat in the book. They say, consider in, in, in 2010, roughly one quarter of the Earth's population, or about 1.8 billion people, were connected to the internet. By 2017, that penetration had reached 3.8 billion people, or about half of the globe. And over the next half dozen years, uh, they say we're going to be able to wire up almost all of the rest of humanity, adding another 4.2 billion people and minds, by the way, uh, to the global conversation. So again, connecting more people, thanks to these technologies, means that we're getting more done. We're innovating more. We're going to see more breakthroughs because more people are, are contributing to that conversation. New business models is, is the sixth force that we're seeing, thanks to these technologies. So they're, um, they're creating new ways of doing business, which in turn are creating new innovations. Um, and we're seeing this in terms of things like, um, uh, I, I love this, uh, and I want to make sure I get this right, a set of pre, uh, they, they say that we're already ordering uh, things online via, say, Alexa, right? We're just saying, hey, Alexa, order me this. And then we've got 3D printers who might be able to actually build what we order immediately. And then we've got drones or autonomous vehicles that will be able to take what was built for us by a 3D printer and deliver it to our door. And, and, and it's, it's kind of, they're calling that an autonomous business model. And it's something that didn't exist before, but it's here. Um, we can do it. We can order something via Alexa, have it printed by 3D printer, delivered to us by autonomous vehicle, and humans very rarely enter the picture. And this is an entirely new business model. And the authors say we're seeing more and more of these types of things emerge thanks to these new technologies. And of course, the last one, um, the seventh force that they're talking about uh, is the really interesting one, um, if, if you ask me. It's longer lives. We're living longer. Um, they say that's this long sought after, you know, fountain of youth is closer than you might think. So there's this guy named David Sinclair, who's co-director of the anti-aging lab at Harvard Medical School. Yes, there is such a thing. Um, he estimates that the first person to live to be 150 has already been born. Um, that's happening. Um, the authors of this book quote a futurist by the name of Ray Kurzeel, who says um, he often discusses the concept of what he calls longevity escape velocity, okay, or the point at which science can extend your life for more than a year for every year that you're alive, okay? So if you're, I'm 54. So what they're saying is that, you know, we're getting close to the point where science may be able to extend my life another 54 years, thanks to technology. Um, and as far future as that sounds, uh, this future says that we're a lot closer than you might expect. He says, it's likely that we're just another 10 or 12 years away from the point where the general public will hit that longevity escape philosophy, which is, it's crazy to think about, but it's here. And the implications of this stuff stretch way beyond just living longer, right? Um, how many of you have enough money to live to be 150 years old? I don't think I do. You know, how many of you are prepared for a 75 year retirement? Um, if you do financial planning, are you helping your clients prepare for stuff like that? So, I mean, these are the conversations that this stuff is having, are, that the, the, these, these, trends are having on our lives and on our clients' lives. And, and that I think is the really interesting point about this book is that you know, we keep talking about technology as the big driver. 
And technology is merely driving other exponentials that are driving other exponentials. And it, it just, the cycle continues, right? So um, we're at that point now, I think, where we used to think of new technologies as, as um, how many of you remember like 10, 12 years ago when we thought social media was like a cool new technology and now it's just part of the conversation. Um, smartphones were a, a, a brand spanking new cool gadget that we could play with and now everybody's got one and it's not a technology anymore. Technology is just kind of the, the, the ground floor and it's creating all these other exponentials that are driving our world forward. So that's the kind of stuff that I think is really, really interesting to consider with all this. And so next slide, this is the point in the conversation where most people's heads explode and say, okay, I can't cope <laughs> when you're talking about all this stuff. This is just, it's, there's too much to consider. It goes back to that first slide, right? What's our number one problem? Who's got time to wrap their arms around all this stuff when we're just busier than ever trying to churn through the work on our desk? And, um, what I always like to fall back, I say I'm an optimist by, um, I guess, nature. And uh, I like to think that there are, there's at least three reasons why all of the stuff that we've been talking about isn't anything to panic over. It's not anything to fret about. Um, it's, there's, there, there are good reasons why this stuff is actually a good thing to consider and, and, and trying to figure out the opportunities that are around all these things. So the first reason that I think that I'm optimistic about all this stuff um, is this slide, right? Uh, Tom, like Tom was zeroed in on this a long time ago. Uh, we're now in what we're calling the fourth industrial revolution, which, uh, so what does that mean, right? To me, it, this is the, it means this, if, if we're in the fourth industrial revolution, it means we've gone through this stuff three times before, right? This has happened before in, in humankind's history and we've gotten through it. It's, it's required a, a whole lot of change. Um, it's, it's produced some pretty incredible innovations and it's, it's, um, it has transformed life as we know it over and over and over again, but you know, we figure out our way through this stuff. That's the thing about us human beings is we're pretty resourceful when push comes to shove. The difference in the fourth industrial revolution is that, yeah, it's moving way faster than the first three ever did. And so we got to really be on our toes and pay attention to this stuff because uh, uh, we're probably going to encounter the fifth industrial revolution um, way sooner than we did the, the last one, right? So um, that's the thing about exponentials is that they start out slow, um, but then they become really, really sudden and move really, really fast. So that's number one. Number one, first reason why I'm optimistic about this stuff is I think we're going to be able to get through it. We've done it before. Um, second reason I'm optimistic, optimistic about this stuff is it, it comes from the World Economic Forum, actually. They release uh, what they call the Future of Jobs Report once every couple of years. The, the most recent one came out in uh, uh, just out late last year, 2020. And uh, one section of that report for the last uh, few issues that are, are uh, additions that have come out kind of focuses on, on declining jobs, jobs that are on the decline thanks to these advancing technologies and jobs that are on the rise, right? So declining roles. Um, these are the top 10 declining roles by 2025, thanks to technology. And you see number three and number four right there, accounting, bookkeeping, payroll clerks, accountants, and auditors are on that list. Um, so yes, the, the first thing to consider is that uh, technology is going to kill jobs to the tune of about 85 million by 2025, according to the World Economic Forum. That's going to happen. Um, the good news is on the flip side of that, the jobs that are on the rise, the emerging roles, right? These are the top 10 emerging roles by 2025. And what this says to me is that these new technologies, we keep talking about them in fear as if they're job killers, right? They're coming in to take our jobs, nothing's ever gonna be the same. And what a lot of people don't stop to consider is that these new technologies create more jobs than they destroy, right? 
uh, World Economic Forum estimates that by 2025, these new technologies are going to create 97 million jobs, right? You can create 12 million more jobs than they destroy. Now, yeah, they're not the same jobs. Um, they look a whole lot different. And what that means is that we're going to have to, um, uh, we're gonna have to look for new people with new jobs, uh, skill sets to help us get through this. We might have to learn a new skill or two ourselves in order to see ourselves through. But th this says to me that there's a whole lot of opportunity baked in uh, to these advancing technologies in terms of where we're going and what we can do as a result of that. Um, so another thing to kind of keep in mind. Next uh, reason, third reason why I'm optimistic about this stuff uh, comes from, actually, no, this is a kind of an, an addendum to the second reason, right? So this is another great book out. I, I'm a, a voracious reader, so I'm going to throw book titles at you all the time. But if you really want a great read about where all this is going, pick up a copy of The Algorithmic Leader by Mike Walsh. He's a futurist and it'll, it'll open your eyes in a lot of areas, but he said something at, at, at one point during all of this that really made me think, and he, he puts it this way, and I wanna make sure I get, I get it right. He says that while leaders worry about the impact of disruptive ideas on their business or industry, what they really should be worrying about is whether their own ideas are disruptive enough. If you are simply automating your existing processes, adding a chat bot to your website, or updating your mobile app, then in all probability, you are not thinking big enough about your future opportunities. Too often, digital transformation is just masked as digital incrementalism, right? And he says, rather than wondering if your job is going to disappear, ask yourself, what is the new job inside of my old one? And I would argue that you can substitute the word organization for job there, right? Rather than wondering if your organization is going to change or disappear, ask yourself, what's the new organization inside my old one? How do we have to evolve uh, in order to take the, the most, in order to get the most out of this, this digital transformation, right? Um, and, and that I think is, is just something, it, it's gonna be, I hate to use the phrase new normal, it's, it's become just so cliche now, but it is, it's, it, this, that's life in, in the world today is, is we can't stand still. We've got to figure out how we need to evolve in order to thrive going forward. We've got to figure that out first so that we can help our clients and customers do that as well, because they're, they're struggling with this stuff just as much as we all are. Um, so just for uh, some food for that there. And then the last thing I want to leave you with, leave you with is, is a note uh, from uh, Alberta Brea, who is Executive Vice President, Digital Strategy at Edelman. And this is the final reason why I'm kind of optimistic about this stuff. Um, he, I'm going to read this to you because it's kind of hard to, to read uh, in his handwriting. But he says, Amazon didn't kill the retail industry. They did it to themselves with bad customer service. Netflix did not kill Blockbuster. Blockbuster did it to themselves with ridiculous late fees, right? Uber did not kill the taxi business. They did it to themselves by limiting the number of taxis and with fare control. Apple did not kill the music industry. They did it to themselves by forcing people to buy full length albums. Airbnb did not kill the hotel industry. They did it to themselves by limiting the availability and pricing options. Here's his bottom line. He says, technology by itself is not the real disruptor. Being non-customer centric is the biggest threat to any business. So as you're wondering what to do about all of these advancing technologies, and folks, these, <laughs> these advancing technologies, they ain't going away. Um, they're just, you know, the, the AI of today is gonna become something five years from now, and that's gonna become something, and this is just life as we know it from here until the day we die. Um, but as you're thinking about these things and, and how to make sense of all that stuff and the impact that these technologies have on you, that question, how can, how can we use these trends, these technologies to be more customer centric, to better serve our clients and customers, to solve, help them solve their problems? Now, if we can do that, um, Imagine how indispensable we are going to be uh, going forward. So that question, how can I help my customers? How, 
how will this trend help them? Right? And how can I be a conduit to that? Um, that is the, the real question. Now, how do I keep up with technology, but how can I use these advancing technologies to better serve the folks that I work with? So that is my spiel on uh, the uh, second hard trend uh, in Dan Burris's trio of hard trends, which is technology. And uh, I think we're moving on now to Rebecca with a look at the third hard trend. Thank you so much, Bill. And there's actually a comment in Conferences IO that says, thank you, Bill, for all of your optimism. I agree that there are numerous opportunities and benefits to adopting technology. Um, and so, yes, thank you for your optimism. Um, and it is a force in our organization. Um, and you'll see perhaps for me that I am not always the most optimistic. Um, and maybe that's my former auditor coming out. I have a little skepticism in me, uh, but uh, I know it's all about balance and I uh, very much appreciate the, the optimism and the opportunity in all of these challenges, both the regulatory uh, and technology and what we're gonna go to next, which is the demographic uh, trends that we're seeing. So there's three specific trends uh, that are and, and issues that I want to address. Um, and they're all intertwined, right? They're all impacted by each other, um, by the other hard trends in tech and government regulations. And so it's a little bit um, of a mess in some ways when you think of how everything impacts each other, just like uh, Bill mentioned with the exponential technology. It's not just the technology, but it's the resulting other exponential trends. So. So we've already talked about uh, technology and government regulation. And when we talk about trends, it's important to talk about both the, the direction of the trends, so increasing or decreasing, and the speed, um, which as Bill just mentioned, um, is exponential in terms of, and accelerated in terms of um, technology. So technology is increasing exponentially and government regulation is increasing. Uh, thankfully, it's not exponential yet, I think, with government regulation, um, even though I think maybe our tax folks might have felt like it was this past year, or perhaps they want to speed it up a little bit, especially when it maybe comes to Form 511. Um, but what we have here is that we have two increasing trends, right? And unfortunately, I think what we're seeing in the CPA pipeline is Newton's third law kind of at play. While tech and government regulation are increasing, our pipeline is actually decreasing and at a faster rate each year. Uh, students and those that advise them are choosing not to pursue the CPA um, or they're even choosing not to major in accounting at all. And at this time when regulation, as we said, is increasing, which is of course increases the need for talent inside of our firms and organizations, we have this crisis of talent. Now you might say, Rebecca, you know, we've seen this before, right? In 2002, we had Sarbanes-Oxley, huge increase in demand for talent um, and the pipeline rose and, and met that demand, right? And you'd be right. So why am I thinking that perhaps uh, this is any different? Well, first is that technology component, right? Those forces already at play. And then the second is some demographic trends um, that I'm going to address a little bit later of generations, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. But first, since we're all CPAs, we got to look at the data. What is the data really telling us, right? This is from AICPA's 2019 Accounting Graduates Supply and Demand Report and it's using data uh, captured in 2018. So you'll see that date in there. The top uh, graph, you'll see a 4% decrease in total accounting graduates from 2017 to 2018, which by the way, was the third year in a row of said decrease. Now at the same time period, NASBA um, said that the number of CPA exam sections um, has been steadily dropping. So from 310,000 CPA exam sections taken in 2016 to just 248,000 um, um, in 2019. 
So the lower graphs actually represent the trends report and those, those echo that decline that NASBA saw. So you have the, on the left side, the decline in new candidates. And on the uh, right side, you have the decline in the number of exam passers. Um, and what that really shows is about one in three accounting graduates, which that number is declining, um, ultimately are becoming CPAs. Now, these numbers um, are still higher than some of the low points that you see on those graphs um, in 2001 for the CPA exam um, candidates or in, for the graduates, and then in 2006 for the CPA exam candidates and the um, exam passers. And one could definitely argue um, where you see those peaks, um, those are the impending new exam. So a new exam was released in 2011 and a new exam was released in 2017. Not a whole new exam, but changes to those exams. And so what you see is, and you could argue, is that that high point is actually artificially um, up because people like to get the exam out of the way before um, it changed, right? The, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't, perhaps. Um, and so you see that that point. But, and so you could argue that that kind of artificially rose. So of course we're gonna have this decline after those, which you do see, right? But I'll be honest, this um, pipeline and reports like this are what keep me up at night. Um, and I don't think it's just me. What I've heard from our members in public accounting, I've heard from our members also in business and industry, um, the talent market is tight and, and it's getting tighter, right? I've also heard from our educator members that uh, enrollments are continuing to decline, some up to 20%. Some programs are eliminating courses, classes, um, master's programs, things like that. And all of that conversation actually was happening before the pandemic hit. And the pandemic has um, had a severe impact, of course, on higher ed. Uh, finally, of uh, note, not um, graphically displayed here, but to, in 2020, NASBA reported that they only saw 204 examinations uh, uh, sections processed. And so that's down another 18% from 2019. Um, and of course, they rightly blame that on the pandemic and COVID-19 because, you know, testing sites were closed for a period of time and things like that. But really what it does is beg the question of, what decline is really hiding behind that kind of 2020 excuse for everything of COVID, right? Um, so all of those were national stats, right? So I wanna show you something that hits a little bit closer to home. Uh, each year, the MACPA and the State Board of Accountancy uh, jointly host the new CPA swearing-in ceremony. Um, last year, unfortunately, thanks COVID, uh, we weren't able to, but we are planning to this year. So save the date now for November 18th. Put it on your calendar. We're going to have, we're going to figure out a hybrid event, but we're excited to celebrate um, this profession again in that way. So, so I went back. Uh, the last couple years, and I took the invite list, the new CPA list uh, that we invite to the swearing in ceremony. And so I put them here in a graph for you all. And so you'll see in Maryland, we see that kind of new exam um, is coming spike actually happen in 2017. And I think this is perhaps due to the both the timing of when we pull that list for the November event. And also because here we're looking at new licensees, remember, right? Whereas those other reports were looking at um, new candidates and new passers of exams. And of course, there's always kind of a gap between passing the exam and actually being licensed. So what does this mean? Well, the national trends report showed a decrease of 14% over the two years following that like new exam spike in 2016, 2017. In Maryland, we saw a 21.6% decline over those two years. So we really have to ask, one, first, you know, why is enrollment down um, and continuing to decline? And then second, uh, why is licensure down and therefore then end actually continuing to decline? And then finally, probably most importantly, what can we do about it, right? 
uh, we already talked about that technology component and how we, as the profession, are really still grappling with the, the and of the human and the technology um, and the upscaling of ourselves that happen when we see that future of jobs report, right? But we're not the only ones seeing these reports. Um, students and those that advise them are seeing those reports. They're seeing the headlines in the news as well. Um, and if we aren't actively figuring out how we're upscaling ourselves, figuring out that and, um, and sharing that with the future of our profession and those that advise them, they might assume that we as a profession aren't, as we like to say, future ready. I also mentioned those two demographic trends that I think are really complicating this whole issue. Uh, the first being the generational characteristics that are now, uh, the generational characteristics of the generation now entering the workforce, which is Gen Z. So I know a lot of us got sick of hearing about millennials, uh, which I, as a very proud millennial myself, um, got convinced that perhaps the millennials now mean to mean anybody younger than us that we really don't agree with. Um, but our pipeline is no longer made up of millennials. Uh, it's Gen Z. Gen Z started graduating college and entering the workforce roughly three years ago. And so what does Gen Z want um, from their employer, from the workplace? Well, according to the Workforce Institute, here's what they're interested in. Number one, flexibility, right? Um, nothing new here, but by the way, since we were kind of forced to give them this flexibility in unprecedented ways uh, due to COVID, I don't think they're gonna give it back, right? So keep that in mind as you're figuring out what is this hybrid work? What does the future of work really look like? Especially as you attract new talent. Uh, number two is training and success skills. I think they've been listening to those future um, jobs reports and that upscaling notion, right? They want those success skills and they expect their employers to help them get it. Number three, um, now this throws a little bit of a wrench um, in our COVID and post-COVID world, um, was in-person communication and feedback. Over the last 16 months, we haven't had much in-person communication at all, right? Um, but if you figured out how to really communicate with your team well um, over things like Zoom or Teams. Um, and if you've figured out the even harder way to give feedback in this remote environment, uh, you might be winning the talent war. Um, you, you have a huge advantage. Number four is trust. I really think here that trust for manager is echoing that flexibility notion of number one, right? So Gen Z doesn't want to not um, just not be micromanaged. Um, it's, it's not about just where they work. It's where, it's when, and it's how, right? They want to be trusted to get the work done, and they want to be measured on the outcome of their work, not on the inputs. Finally, number five, they want clear uh, career expectations and quick advancement. And I'll tell you from my work with um, firms, especially firms um, in strategy conversations and things, this seems to be a constant challenge for folks. You know, what is the, the pipeline? Where are we showing um, different paths to partner or different roles um, of growth opportunities inside our organizations? So there you have it. Those are the top ones of your next hire. Now I have to give a little bit of a warning here um, because I'm about to stereotype our profession, which is not something I want to do, but I think I need to do it in order to illustrate a little bit of a point. And I know this does not reflect everyone. And I know it does not reflect every organization. In fact, I'd argue that it reflects us less and less day by day. But I think if we're being honest, um, I want you to ask yourselves, do you think that young people think of our great profession when they think of these ones? As a proud Maryland CPA and a proud member of this fantastic profession, I'm unfortunately not convinced that they do. 
Additionally, not um, mentioned because of its lesser importance, but really I think because of its kind of assumed priority is that Gen Z are digital natives, right? They expect the organizations that they work for to be digital as well. Now, post pandemic more than ever, right? Uh, this is SAGE's Practice of Now 2020 report. And it showed that 84% of their respondents agreed that as digital natives, Gen Z has progressive expectations. They have progressive attitudes um, and they have talents that they uh, want to see reflected and nurtured by the organizations um, that they work in. And so if organizations are hoping to attract them, uh, that's one of those top things. The last sentence here, though, is what really caught my eye, and it begins to address that um, second demographic trend that I wanted to talk about. And I believe that it's affecting our organizations and our pipeline. Um, well, it's affecting our organizations, and I think it's disproportionately affecting our pipeline. The last sentence reads this, Gen Z and millennials, sorry, we can't get rid of them just yet, are positively characterized as inherently diverse, inclusive, and entrepreneurial. Our population has changed and it's continuing to change. Um, it's becoming more and more diverse. The US Census Bureau data that you see here shows that by 2045, non-Hispanic whites will make up less than half of all Americans. Now I know what you're saying, 2045, Becca, I'm just trying to get through today. I'm trying to get through July 15th. I'm looking for Form 511. I get you. Um, but when we look at this actually generationally, it's important to note that on January 1st, 2020, before the world kind of went crazy, um, non-Hispanic whites under the age of 18 were already in the minority. By the way, those under the age of 18 is Gen Z and following behind it, Gen Alpha. So among all the young people, um, so under the age of 18 in the US now, there are more minorities than there are non-Hispanic white. What does that really mean, right? Your future talent, the talent that you're trying to hire today, the future of this profession is diverse. And honestly, that's really fantastic news, right? Because diversity breeds innovation and diversity improves operational and financial performance. Diverse teams um, have expanded market share and they're 158% more likely to understand their customer and client base and be able to innovate. But <laughs> there's always a but um, that's only when it's coupled with inclusion, right? And here's what I mean by that. Homogeneous teams, so non-diverse teams, have pretty average performance, right? That's kind of like the baseline. When you have a diverse team that is not inclusive, what does that look like? Well, team members in those um, organizations might ignore or suppress individual differences. Um, you might hear people say, you know, I don't see color or I don't care about your color, gender, religion, orientation, whatever, right? And as a result, probably unintentionally, um, what they're doing is actually devaluing the contributions of the individual team member. Um, and what that does is it kind of forces the individuals to feel like they have to hide or cover or kind of leave a part of themselves at home when they come to work. And therefore, it is no surprise that when you're only having a portion of someone dedicated to their work, you have lower performance. On the flip side, when you can have a diverse and inclusive team, here the team members, they see, they acknowledge, and they value the individual differences among the team members. Those differences are viewed as assets uh, to the group. And so if people full, show up fully as a result. And of course, if you have a full person um, dedicated to their work and you have the um, cognitive dissonance or friction of having um, a diverse team that innovates, that leads to higher performance. So the question is, is the accounting profession in the broadest sense diverse? And almost more importantly, 
is it inclusive? Well, we have made um, some progress here and we need to celebrate that certainty, um, especially in the recruitment of diverse talent. We have a really, really long way to go. Um, this is from IMA um, and CalCPA's joint um, research study, which the MACPA and several other uh, CPA state societies participated in. And the results are, are they're really humbling. Um, while the US profession is 62% female, it's 9% Hispanic, 8.5% Black, and 12% Asian, for every 10 senior leaders, only two are female and only one is non-white. In their survey, only half of the respondents believed the profession to be inclusive and less than half believed it to be equitable. On the left-hand side uh, of the graphic, you can see there the impact that this inequity and exclusion is having. And it's not only preventing the advancement of diverse professionals, um, it's causing them to leave not only their organizations, but the profession all together. So what can we do about these trends in pipeline? And, and really, where can we go from here? Um, where can we find the optimism? Where can we find the, the next steps to really change the narrative of this story? And so I want to share that uh, with from three different perspectives. I wanna share with you what the AICPA is doing nationally. Um, I want to share with you what the MACPA is doing locally. And I think, and maybe, uh, I, th I think I'm right, that what we're doing locally impacts the, what we do nationally. Um, it borders, you know, it, it bleeds what each state is able to accomplish. Um, there's a me in every state. Um, which is exciting. And um, I think it, it has an impact. And then finally, what you can do to help because it takes all of us, all of these trends really, when I think of it, um, Tom mentioned it, the grassroots um, and the pack and the key person and filling that bench. Um, Bill mentioned it with the technology um, and, and how we get through this like the other industrial revolutions, right? Um, and especially with these pipeline trends, it takes a community of people. Um, and one of the things I've seen so beautifully displayed over the, the last, gosh, 15, 16 months with COVID is that, that tax list serve, which I think has already been mentioned once. But the people, the individuals helping each other, and especially Karen Cirillo, which we're going to talk about a little bit in a little uh, bit of, as well, um, it's it's a it's a wonderful thing, guys. Uh, community makes a difference. So, first nationally, um, as you might be aware, uh, the CPA licensure process and the exam they're evolving. The AICPA and NASBA both passed uh, the new CPA evolution model back in the spring of 2020. Now, this model um, seeks to establish a strong core. Uh, that's made up of three exams with the traditional accounting, auditing, and tax, but it's now incorporating in each of those parts technology. Then it introduces a discipline model for that fourth exam, and what happens here is the candidate actually chooses their discipline, whether tax compliance and planning, business reporting and analysis, or information systems and controls, and they take the exam for that discipline. Now, the belief is that this approach more accurately reflects the current reality of practice. Um, it's also more adaptable and flexible for possible additional disciplines in the future. Um, and it enhances the public protection and does so without creating you know, multiple licenses or um, maybe the public confusion, right? The CPA-tax, CPA-audit, right? So what won't change? is that it's designed for that one to two year level professional. Um, there are no new experience requirements involved with this. Um, the exam will still be um, no more than the current 16 hour for exam model. Uh, candidates still has to pass each exam, um, which can be taken in any order. And a CPA is a CPA is a CPA. Um, there is no uh, differenti differentiation um, intended in the market between the disciplines once the um, candidate has that credential. So just like you have no idea what I scored on my CPA exam or Tom or you know that that CPA um, speaks for itself. 
same with this, that the, the discipline that they chose, um, the thought is hopefully there's not an intended at least market differentiation. What does change is that the candidate passes those three core sections um, and then that one discipline section. And then to make room for the technology component um, in that core um, and to cover some of the more discrete content and range of skills uh, inside of the exam, they're gonna have to strip out some of the more highly specialized content. I'm thinking things like pension accounting, for example, um, and those things might be removed. Now, not all of this is decided on. There are task forces working on all of these things. So what's the plan for this? Uh, the plan is to launch that new exam in January of 2024, which I know feels far away, but it really isn't. We lost that year to COVID. I think sometimes I forget what year it is and time just doesn't make sense anymore, but um, not that too far away. Um, and before that exam actually hits, there will be a blueprint um, exposed for public comment. And what our educators have been eagerly awaiting was finally uh, released this week, week for them, which is the new model curriculum. Um, and so next week, this, this was released this week with a joint event of AAA uh, at NASBA and AICPA. But next week at MACPA Educators Conference, we're gonna spend time with representatives from both AICPA and NASBA um, to really kind of discuss, get into a little more details and get some questions answered. So that's on the, the pipeline, but we also mentioned this uh, D, E, and I kind of demographic trends. So what is the AICPA doing on a national front for that? Well, they've had um, several committees, task forces in place for years. Um, MACPA's own uh, past chair and, and rock star, Kimberly Ellison Taylor, it will actually become the chair of AICPA's National Commission on Diversity and Inclusion, NCDI, in the next year. Um, and that group has historically focused on racial diversity and inclusion, uh, but has started to recently involve some of the, um, the already established Women's Initiatives Executives Committee, uh, which our CEO Jackie Brown um, served on a few years ago. And just this month, they formed uh, the first AICPA LGBTQ Initiatives Committee. You can see all of their resources um, on their website, aicpa.org slash diversity. They have some really great toolkits and things like that to examine. That's what's going on nationally. What are we doing about it here locally? Um, so at the M MACPA, uh, we reorganized um, our foundation over the last two years. It's a 501c3 entity. And we did that in order for it to cover kind of a broader range of activities to support the pipeline and to support diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives in the profession. Uh, what we do, what our mission is at the foundation is to build a strong and diverse talent pipeline. Uh, we want to have resources for future CPAs, for educators. We want to support diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives in the profession. We want to provide training. We want to grant scholarships, of course, um, and we want to facilitate those mentoring connections um, in order to grow, um, engage our profession. What this looks like really kind of practically um, are programs um, and initiatives, right? So programs like our Student Leadership Academy, which we started in 2015. And this year we had to again virtualize, um, but we named kind of reset it as the Future CPA Leadership Series. Um, it looks like our mentor program, which by the way, applications are now open for. So if you go to that community um, tab on the website, you'll see um, the mentorship application uh, there. Our Candid Conversation Series. Um, so this brings that quarterly cadence um, and a great learning opportunity for you um, and your colleagues on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our Women to Watch um, programs, which is scheduled for September 24th, in person and virtual, will be that week, I think, is our first um, hybrid um, events uh, and Women to Watch nominations are open now, so be sure to do that. Our Leadership Academy, this is um, for emerging leaders in firms and organization, giving them those um, skills as they move from a individual contributor focused on the technical work to all of a sudden managing people and what do those skills look like differently. That is actually scheduled for August 18th through the 20th. 
in person. That's what we heard loud and clear from our young professionals is that they wanted to be in person. So we're um, able to do that in our MACBA offices. That's open for registration. And then finally, I kind of started with this, but our CPA swearing in ceremony. Save the date for that. That is scheduled for November 11, or November 18th, sorry. Um, and again, will be a hybrid experience that we're working on. Of course, uh, scholarships are part of that and also partnerships with all of our universities um, and organizations like Junior Achievement that is allowing us to spread the message of our great profession and career opportunities um, downstream to high schoolers, middle schoolers, and even elementary school, which is crazy. But with the, the prevalence of STEM, we got, we got to get younger and younger to inspire the next generation. Um, organizations like NABA, the National Association of Black Accountants, um, like Beta Alpha Psi, the Maryland Department of Education, and of course the AICPA. So that's what your association is doing. But as individual CPAs and members, here's what you can personally really do and help us with as we move the needle. Um, show your Maryland CPA proud. Um, this is something that each of us really can do. And it can be as small as remembering to say, I'm a CPA that does what? Um, whatever that blank, fill in the blank is, and not just, oh, I'm an accountant when somebody asks you what you do. Um, our profession is somewhat hidden, right? Um, but it is the backbone of our economy. And as Tom Peters would say, and in a great podcast he did with Bill several months ago, it's a helping profession. Um, it's also a really great career path, right? Um, with some financial benefit too, that we don't always display because we are humble, um, but students look for that. Um, it's full of opportunities, right? So we need to find ways big and small uh, to share the message of the profession and share our own CPA stories and journeys. Um, and one request I have of you, um, when talking to those that are considering the CPA, let's stay away from the war stories. <laughs> like a friend that's about to go into surgery doesn't need to hear about the ways that it can go wrong, but maybe just needs some encouragement. Let's be that encouragement. Let's be that cheerleader. Um, maybe keep the reminiscing about the, the cow palace and the, and the wooden tables um, to like the happy hour with our colleagues that might be already CPAs, right? Um, number two, let's have those uncomfortable conversations, right? Um, let's have those candid conversations um, that we really need to have regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, let's examine our own bias, um, perhaps unconscious, probably unintended, but let's be vulnerable um, to really dig into those things. It's important, not just um, socially, but organizationally and for our businesses. And then finally, contribute to the work of the foundation, uh, whether that's monetarily, uh, where we've established several donor levels for both individuals or, and organizations, um, or simply if it's just by showing up and promoting the foundation events and programs. So that's what you can do as an individual. Um, but I also wanted to share a little bit of what, what you can do um, as an organization and as a leader in your organization. Um, first, of course, I already mentioned the opportunity to be a, a donor and sponsor of the foundation. Um, but I also want to encourage you to encourage your new hires to become CPAs. Uh, this is research actually just released last week by the Illinois Society of CPAs. And it shows here that the number two influencer of those choosing to become a CPA exam or CPA or not was their employer. Professors also, you see number three, they play a big part. Um, so if you are a professor or if you serve on an advisory board, you play and can play a huge role as well. Um, you'll also note, unfortunately, professional associations like the MACPA are down there at just 5%. Um, so we don't hold a high uh, influencer role. So we especially need you in our community um, to influence and encourage the next generation of CPAs. Finally, they also did some research on, on the challenges um, and the number one challenge um, stated by those who either started the CPA process and then abandoned it, um, decided not to pursue it or all, at all, or were still kind of weighing their options was workload time commitments. Um, and this is something that as leaders and organizations, we actually can do something about. 
Now, I'm not by any means saying that is easy, especially with those increasing regulation trends, I know. Um, but do what you can to really prioritize your team members' development. Um, it benefits you and it benefits them in the long run as well. It gives them growth opportunity inside your organizations. It gives your team additional skills and it actually increases retention when people feel like they're being invested in, right? Now, I haven't been looking at the questions. I'm scrolling down um, and I don't see it yet, but I'm sure somebody's going to ask. It's the 150 hours, isn't it, Becca? That's the thing that's ca causing people to um, not take the exam. And I'm not saying that that doesn't need to be looked at, um, but I am saying it didn't even make it in the top 10 here. So yes, we should examine that, um, but let's start to take action now where we can. Um, let's give time off for the exam or to study if we need to. Um, let's assist with the cost of the review courses. Let's incentivize the CPA and encourage team members along that path. Um, and then to end this section, I'd like to ask you, and I'm going to open up a poll now. Um, these challenges were always present, right? Um, so what helped you? right? If you're on here, you're either um, a candidate, a future CPA, hopefully I didn't discourage you in any way. Um, and if you are a CPA, what encouraged you to be able uh, to overcome some of those challenges? So the way I have this poll set up is actually for you to be able to enter your responses, but also be able to like up using the little thumbs, um, other people's responses. So we can really quickly kind of get a um, prioritized list of ideas that uh, we as the MACPA can do and you as its members um, can do as we encourage uh, the next generation of CPAs. Becca, that was great. And Bill <clears throat> and Tom too, I love how you got really specific about things people can do. And I love this last poll. Becca, I want to keep it open and I want to, uh, I want to start. Becca's got the slide up right now, which talks about the last poll that uh, she put out there, like uh, what what's really helped you overcome these challenges? And let's just take a look at that, Tom, Bill, Becca. We also have our executive committee and our um, award-winning Karen Cirillo in the Zoom room now. So anybody jump in, what are you seeing there? And, uh, and then we'll take a look at some of the questions that are in conferences I owe to. Pull this up. Yeah, I mean, overwhelmingly, um, you only see the top nine here because of the, the ranking, um, but you should on your um, screen see that the full listing um, support for my, my company, number mm -hmm. one. Um, so what can we do as organizational leaders um, to further that support, um, supportive workplace number number two? So uh, job, it, it's, it's really up to the employers. Um, and so let's, let's do what we can. I'd actually add that um, in, in talking to my students, uh, one of them that was up there, I don't see it now, but was, oh, here it is, perseverance. I mean, I try to let them know that this may be the first time that they actually fail at something mm -hmm. once or twice, right? And that they need to be resilient enough to, to move on. I think that that's actually where we lose many of our candidates. Uh, so I'm hopeful that that one resonates. I love how Kimberly... Um tells that as part of her story, right? Um, that, that she failed the first time. And I think we need to do more of that. I failed uh, reg the first time. Um, and so how, how do we tell those stories and kind of be more um, transparent? Because I think we put it in our past um, and we try not to think about it, try not to talk about it. I know that the license model is changing again. And even from when, even today, the way it um, works and exam works is different than a lot of the leaders took the exam. So they feel like they don't they can't give advice. Oh, it's computerized now. I don't remember how to, I, I feel like I can't share. Um, so how can we learn about what they're facing in the exam model now um, and speak into it um, and encourage them? Becca, any questions and conferences I owe that we should take a look at now or maybe? Soon? Yeah, I just want to quick see that the most important thing you heard today, um, new CPA exam format, uh, the future is diverse and something and we need to do something now uh, to support that. Yep, tremendous impacts of technology. Um, yep, Lot, lots of things um, to, to be thinking about. Um, and to then, um, let's see, oops. Oh, I don't have it. 
Hmm. I didn't have that one linked there, um, but you should see the results of the what um, can you start, stop, or um, do differently as a result, right? Um, to take some of these insights and to really move them uh, to action. In terms of questions, um, there are a lot. Let's see. Um, students not majoring in accounting, um, what are they majoring in? Um, the statistics I just looked at yesterday for um, all of higher ed saw that there's only a couple um, places that had increased enrollments. Um, the IT obviously is one of them. Actually, logistics was one of them. Um, and so I know a lot of programs um, having um, data analytics, I think we've seen some increases in, in finance majors as well. And, um, and actually I've heard some anecdotal um, evidence that uh, while accounting used to be one of like the highest starting salary majors, um, it's now towards the bottom. So even within the business school, it is not the preferred major of folks. Um, let's see, what else? Um, I love the, and we might have, I'm looking at them too, Becca, we, there might be so many, we might have to do something as a follow-up. Sure, yeah. This group, because some great questions and I love what's coming in. Um, um, someone's been jumping in and answering and appreciate that, but um, this is awesome. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you all so much. It was a pleasure. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Good work. Congrats to everybody. Thank you.